Good morning, good morning, welcome, welcome to our next episode in Samuel, chapter 15, I'm sorry, chapter 12, part 15. I don't know if we'll get through this whole thing today, but uh, I like this uh, chapter. Samuel, it's probably the last time Samuel is going to actually address the Israelite people as a group, because uh, it's called Samuel's farewell speech. But uh, he doesn't die until chapter 25, so he hasn't gone yet, but he's going to be dealing mostly with Saul and then with David a little bit. Uh, and so uh, he's not going anywhere yet, but uh, uh, they called this a farewell speech, and I think it's basically to the Israelite nation as a whole. And he's going to be mainly dealing with individual leaders, particularly Saul at this point, and then David later on. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this time. We get to spend in your word. Thank you, Lord, for men like Samuel that gives us some insight uh, into how you want us to be uh, when it comes to uh, understanding your commandments. And thank you, Lord, for men like him who were not afraid to uh, demonstrate uh, your power to the others in, in a bold way. Uh, and uh, it, I hope that all of us can have that boldness when the when the time comes. I thank you, Lord, so much for all you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so we're jumping into Samuel chapter 12. Oh, farewell speech. There's a lot there's a lot of information packed in here. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Because he mentions a lot of things in the past. So I kind of like made reference to them, but sometimes maybe I'll just mention the verse. And if you want to jot it down, you can to go back and look at it. We may read some of them too. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. So starting in verse 1, let me get the verses up here. And I found this neat little picture of maybe uh, what it might have looked like when Samuel was addressing the people. I don't know if Saul was there during this because he's going to actually speak kind of negatively about Saul. But maybe, like I said, uh, Samuel was a pretty bold guy, so I don't think it may bother him. Uh, that Saul was sitting there listening. Remember, they just had a uh, huge success in, in, uh, in uh, defeating the Amorites. And so that uh, the people are on a high note right now uh, from chapter 11. Verses. Okay. So starting in verse 1, uh, in this farewell speech, Samuel asked the Israelites to point out any wrongs he had committed during his time as Israel's judge. By doing so, Samuel was reminding them that he could be trusted to tell the truth. He was also reminding them that having a king was their idea, not his. Samuel was setting the stage for the miraculous thunderstorm recorded uh, when we get to verses 16 through 19. So the people could not blame him when God punished them for their selfish moves. So let's dig in here. Verse 1. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us. Uh, wrong verse. Uh, here's verse 1. We're going we're gonna to read that verse in a second. And Samuel said unto the, uh, all Israel, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice, and all that you said unto me have made a king over, over you. So it was their idea, and we go back to 1 Samuel 8, 5 through 8, and this is where they requested it. And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. Remember that, uh, number one, God was uh, their, their leader at this point. Samuel uh, was their judge and king. And Samuel was their judge and prophet. So uh, both God and Samuel were uh, were uh, kind of put down in this statement. Verse 7. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in that all that you say unto thee. They have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even until this day wherewith have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. And also looking at uh, verses 19 through 22. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we may also be like other nations. 
and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city. Samuel wasn't very happy. So Samuel continued to serve the people as priest, prophet, and judge. But Samuel exercised more and more political and military control of the tribes. You go back to verse 715. Samuel was the original judge, and he did judge Israel all the days of his life. But we can see here that Saul is starting to take over that role. And this is something that God had warned them about. Okay, verse 2. And now, behold, the king walketh before you, and I am old and gray-haired. And behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you from my childhood until this day. He's talking about his sons. We remember back in verse uh, chapter 3, verse 10. And the Lord came and stood and called us at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for thy ser servant heareth. This is back when Samuel was a boy. And he was first called by the Lord into the service of being the prophet and judge over the Israel. And he has walked, uh, he has walked boldly uh, since since that time. We see in verses in chapter three, nineteen and twenty. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan even to Bathsheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. Okay, going on to verse three. This is where he's going to start talking about the fact that he's never never taken anything uh, or been a burden on the people. Uh, and it says here, whose ox? Behold, here I am witness against me before the Lord and before, before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose ass have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or whose hand have I received any bribe to blind my eyes therewith? And I will restore it to you. So he's challenging the people to point out, have I done anything uh, that would be uh, considered a crime against you? So he mentions whose ox. Going back to Numbers 16, 15. And Moses was very wroth and said unto the Lord, Respect not that, or th their offering. I have not taken one ass of them, neither have I hurt one of them. Moses was in a similar situation where he uh, he had never done nothing to, the, to cause the people uh, to... Uh, to go against him. I'm talking about blinding their eyes, or that should hide my eyes at him. Looking at Exodus 23, 8. Thou shalt take no gift, for the gift blindeth the wise and perverteth the words of the righteous. In other words, when a leader accepts gifts from the people, uh, it has a tendency to put, make it appear as though that there are people, that they're being influenced by a certain group of people. And that can be a bad thing for a leader. So it's not a good idea for leaders to on a, uh, to uh, be people that are willing to take gifts. It also mentioned that in Deuteronomy 16, 19. Thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift. Whenever you see that, respect persons. It means everybody, no matter what their position, should be treated the same as God does. Gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. So that's the idea behind that. Okay, on to verse 4. And they said, Thou hast not defrighted us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. So they, uh, the people uh, responded correctly. That uh, Samuel has not done any of those things. Let's look at Psalms 37, 5, and 6 on this subject. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth the righteousness as the light, and the judgment as the noonday. He'll make it very clear. In other words, your testimony. Also looking at Dan 6.4. Daniel is the same way. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. They could not find none occasion, nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. What a great testimony if, if, if you have that kind of a testimony with people. And John also mentions in 3 John 12, Demetrius hath a good report of all men and of all the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record that ye know that our record is true. 
So again, our testimony, and it helps us to realize that we tell the truth. That's it, and that's what he's trying to gain here. A great testimony is very valuable in showing others that God is great. On to verse 5. And he said unto them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day, that you have not found aught in my hand. And they answered, He is witness. So he's also saying that God is also the witness. He found aught in my hand. Uh, going to Exodus 22, 4 on that one. If thou... If the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. So if you're caught stealing from another man, uh, you have to repay double. Of course, Samuel was never caught that way. Verse 6. And Samuel said unto the people, It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron, and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Trying to remind the people that uh, God has always helped them, always been there to help them ever since they came out of Egypt. And here they want a king instead of use it, having God. So it is the Lord, Exodus 6.26. These are that Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, Bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their armies. So another, another uh, leader that was uh, appointed by God uh, and that the God was going to assist and doing, uh, doing good for the people. So all these are kind of, Samuel's kind of just laying out his case. Verse 7. One second. I just spilled some coffee on my keyboard. Hopefully the keyboard works now. That wasn't good. Okay. Verse 7. Now therefore, stand still, that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and to your fathers. Now he's going to, now we're going to have a little history lesson. Going to Micah 6.4 for a sec. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed thee out of the house of servants, and I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And by and uh, For what reason? Looking at Isaiah 1.18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. That your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And also Micah 6, 2 and 3. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy, and ye strong foundation of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. O my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. Again, this idea that, uh, why are you forsaken me? The Lord speaking. On to verse 8. When Jacob was come to eat into Egypt, and your fathers cried unto the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt, and made them dwell in this place. Remember originally that the, from Egypt, they were calling to the Lord for help. And the, and the Lord sent uh, Aaron and Moses and Miriam to, to, to convince Pharaoh to let them go, and he succeeded. You know, God succeeded, I should say. So they cried unto the Lord, and that, that time I'm talking about was back in Exodus 2, 23 and 24. And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, the children of Israel sighed by reason of their bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up to God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groanings, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, in order to give them the land that they're occupying right now. Verse 10. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And also Exodus 4, 14 and 15. 14 through 16, I should say. And the angel of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, It is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he would be glad in his heart. Aaron became the spokesperson. Moses was always concerned about his, uh, some people think he might have had a stutter. He didn't speak real well. So he asked Aaron to be his spokesman. That's what that passage is talking about. So God, God appeased that, even though God said that uh, he would give Moses the voice he needed, but uh, he still appointed Aaron to help him. Okay, going on to verse 9. 
And when they fought, forgate the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, captain of the host of Hazar, and into the hand of the Philistines, into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against him. All these particular different individuals, all through Judges in Deuteronomy. Let's just look at a few here. It mentioned, uh, forgetting the Lord, Deuteronomy 32, 18. On the rock they beget thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Judges 3, 7. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgot the Lord their God, and served Balaam and, his, and the groves. Remember that? Remember Sisera, the story of Sisera in Judges 4, 2. The Lord sold him into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan. And reigned in Hazar, and the captain of whose host was Sisera, who dwelt in Heshereth of the Gentiles. And that famous battle uh, with the Philistines, also Judges ten seven, and the angel was hot against Israel. And he sold them in the hands of the Philistines, into the hands of the children of Ammon. I think the important thing to remember here is that uh, God is uh, is who He is. He uses other nations against uh, a nation that's in defiance to him. I think that's where America needs to be careful, uh, that uh, they don't go down some of these paths that we read in here. But I'm afraid that they are. I'll be very honest. I think that this election has more. It will show us exactly where we are with God, and I'm afraid of what that answer is going to be. Uh, so please get out and vote. And vote based on what you believe God would be the best interest for a God-fearing nation. So, where was I? Uh, Judges 13, 1, another place of the Philistines. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. And it mentioned Moab, that's Judges 3, 2. Only that generation of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at least such before I knew nothing thereof. <clears throat> when they went up against Moab, they didn't have any formal military training. Okay, on to verse 10. Continuing in his little history lesson here. And they cried unto the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served Balaam and Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies and we will serve thee. So speaking of these particular two uh, uh, individuals, Balaam and uh, Asherah are two gods and goddesses uh, that uh, were worshipped by the Canaanites. It's, it's always amazed me when I saw, see some of these, how that people have turned to uh, these particular, the images of Balaam and Asherah were actually pagan gods. Let's look at a few verses on this. Uh, in Judges 10.10, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee. It's another time that they actually realized they had forsaken God and were serving Balaam. And also that speaking of being delivered in Judges 10, 15 through 16, another judge was raised up to be delivered. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord, and his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. This same cycle, up and down, up and down, uh, constantly. And we're no different. This nation started out as a Christian nation serving God. I find it very fascinating that when you look back at some of the major, major uh, Ivy League colleges uh, on the East Coast, that most of them were set up to teach pastors. So it's a new, uh, we have plenty of people to teach God's word uh, in a new country. And if you read some of their old charters, you'll actually see a written in there about how they should uh, put out uh, good church leaders and pastors out of their schools. And now they're so, they're so uh, left-leaning that uh, you wouldn't even, they probably don't even have a Christian in there. Never mind uh, putting out pastors. Okay, continuing on. So Baal was believed to be the son of Ei, uh, chief deity of the Canaanites. Baal was regarded as the god of thunder and rains. Thus he controlled vegetation and agriculture. We're going to find out that uh, that curse, that uh, punishment, uh, is going to be against 
uh, this particular god. Because it's actually going to use something, uh, use what this was a god of to destroy crops. And we're going to see that when we get to chapter verse 16. Fascinating use of God's uh, power. Asheroth was a goddess of love and war. She was called Ishtar in Babylon and Asteri and or Aphrodite in Greece. She represented fertility. The Canaanites believed that by the sexual union of Baal and Asheroth, the earth would be magically rejuvenated and made fertile. Okay, so going on to verse 11. And the Lord sent Eurybolo and Bedan and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side and you dwelled safe. Most people believe that, uh, that the, uh, the use of the word Sam, uh, Bedan here and Samuel uh, was, a, uh, was, a, was not the word we think it is. So why would Samuel be mentioning, uh, talking about himself in the second person? That doesn't make sense. But some other, so speaking of Jeroboam, we remember him back in Judges 6, Judges 6 and 7. And Bedan, whose name occurs nowhere else as a judge of Israel, uh, and Brother Patrick and others are supposed to be a contradiction of Ben Dan, the son of Dan, in other words, by which they suppose Samson, it might have been meant by Samson, is meant as the Tagram reads, uh, the, uh, the Septuagint and the Syriac and the Arabic. However, instead of Bedan read Barak, and the two letter versions instead of Samuel have Samson. So these readings are adopted by uh, Hobart and appear to be genuine for it is not probable that Samuel would uh, enumerate himself. Now look at the famous uh, statement in Hebrews 11 uh, where these same people are mentioned again, uh, 32 through 34. And what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak, of Samson and of Jeff, Jeffy, and David also and Samuel of the prophets. There Samuel's mentioned because actually Paul is talking about it. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, brought righteousness, obtained promise, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valent and fight, turned to fight the enemies of the aliens. And aliens here is talking about any foreign nation attacking Israel, not anything from outer space. <laughs> So Japheth, we see mentioned in Judges 11, uh, pretty much the whole chapter. And in the next section, verses 12 through 15, God granted the nation's request for a king, but his commands and requirements remain the same. God was to, be, was to be their true king, and both Saul and the people were to be subject to his laws. No person is ever exempt from God's laws. No human action is outside his jurisdiction. God is the true king of every area of life. We must recognize his kingship and pattern our relationships, work, life, and home, life according to his principles. So let's break this passage down, verses 12 through 15. And when he saw that Nahish, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, you said unto me, Nay, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. And Nash was, uh, was a, uh, what we, we saw in chapter 11. So when, uh, when the Lord, when the Lord was your king, looking back at Judges 8, 22 and 23. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's sons also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. So they wanted to make Gideon king too at that time frame. They wanted a king back then. And, and, and Gideon's rule, uh, I mentioned the same thing. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you, the Lord shall rule over you. So only a few chapters ago, the, uh, it was well known that uh, God was your ruler. And until, until the king that, they, that God wanted was put into place, was ready, uh, God did not want to appoint a king. Okay, move on to verse 13. Now therefore, behold the king whom you have chosen and whom you have desired. And behold, the Lord has set a king over you. So the Lord uh, allowed them to have a king and actually recommended one. 
That's when they picked Saul. So let's look at a few verses on that. That was back uh, back in Samuel 10, 24. And Samuel said to all the people, See you him whom the Lord hath chosen. There was none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. So that's when uh, Saul was selected. And Samuel uh, even uh, played along with it. And whom ye selected. Man, he's really pressing the point that you decided to have a king, not God. And we saw that mentioned back in uh, verse five, uh, chapter 8, verse 5. And he said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in the ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all nations. So that's when the people were going against what, uh, what Samuel said. But they still wanted, they still desired a king. And Hosea actually talks about this in Hosea 13, 11. I gave thee a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. So we're going to find out that God's going to also take Samuel away. I mean, Saul. Okay, verse 14. But if you fear the Lord and serve him, obey his voice and not rebel against the commands of the Lord, then shall both you and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. So you could have a king, but you could also uh, obey, the, obey the Lord and follow his guidance, even with the king, including the king also. This idea of fearing the Lord, it's a phrase of the Old Testament meaning piety, meaning reverence reverential trust, and ain't, ain't a true fear, but it's a, it's a fear to, to follow the, the Lord's ways. And one, one of the major ways is when, when you see evil the same way God does, where God hates, uh, God's hatred of evil. Looking at Joshua 24, 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. Okay, verse 15. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the command of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you, as it was against your fathers. So if you won't obey the Lord, this is what, uh, what you can look forward to. Joshua 24, 20. If you shall forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, and he will turn and do you hurt, consume you. After that, he hath done you good. So he's not going to take it lying down. Also look at Isaiah 1, verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Jump into verse 20. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Giving you fair warning. Verse 16. And as I like to say a lot, uh, I think that uh, America is way overdue. It was kind of a cute saying uh, mentioned by uh, Billy Graham, I think it was. But it was somebody, uh, uh, some big famous teacher like him, it said, uh, if it wasn't him. He said one time that uh, if God doesn't punish America, then he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And think about that. Think about that for a second. That's true, and I think we we are definitely a Romans 1 society right now. If you want to see what I'm talking about, read the latter part of Romans 1, and you'll see what God gave us fair warning about how he feels about sexual immorality. Okay. So, verse 16. Now, therefore, stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. This is where we're going to get into what he's going to do. I want you to really pay attention to what time of the year it is, too, in this particular punishment. Other times that he's used, uh, uh, he made a stand in Exodus 14, 13. And Moses said to the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. Remember what God did to the Egyptians when they were, uh, were not following his uh, commandments. He think he's going to do a similar thing to these people. Also, Exodus 14, 21. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back. God's mighty power, the strong east wind all night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. Famous crossing of the Red Sea. And verse 31. 
And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. As you remember that uh, once that uh, once they got through there safely on dry ground, he killed the entire army of the uh, of the uh, Egyptians. Okay, so on to the punishment. It is not wheat, isn't it not? Is it not wheat harvest today? I will call unto the Lord, and He shall send thunder and rain, that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking you a king. And so the wheat harvest came near the end of the dry season during the months of May and June. Because rain rarely fell during this period, a great thunderstorm was considered a miraculous event. It was, it was not a beneficial miracle, however, because rain during the wheat harvest could damage the crops and cause them to rot quickly. This, occurrence, this unusual occurrence showed God's displeasure with Israel's demand for a king. So looking at a few other times that uh, we saw the same thing in 1 Samuel 7, 9 through 11, 10. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. And, and as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines, and discomforted them, and they were smitten before Israel. So God has used thunder before to, to, to eliminate their enemies. But with your wickedness, what will he do to you? And going back, to, let's look at verse chapter 8, verse 6 and 7 for a minute. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. That's God speaking to Samuel. He said, go ahead and do it, uh, because they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. And continuing on in verses 18 through 20. So Samuel called unto the Lord. And the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for the servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. For we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, you have done all this wickedness. You turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. So he's telling them, you can still turn around. So in this, uh, it's a, a very similar situation to when in Exodus 32.30. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, You have sinned the great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord in pre-adventure. I shall make an atonement for your sins. That's when they, uh, they uh, I believe that's when they served that. Uh, trying to remember what story that was. I think that's the golden calf. Yeah, that's the golden calf incident and also in Deuteronomy 11 16 turn not aside take heed to yourself that your heart be not deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them they've had plenty of warning about this and you say well we don't we don't we don't worship idols or do we if you, anything that you find more important than God is some is an idol it can be power it can be money it can be riches it can be the love of money, I should say. Uh, it's, in other words, where money is more important to, to earn money than it is to worship God and things of that nature. Okay, moving on. I'll break this down a little bit. Verse 21. And turn ye not aside, for then shall you go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. Cannot profit. Habakkuk 2.18. I like this verse. Uh, shows a little bit of God's humor. What profit is the grain of the image that the maker thereof hath gra graven it? The molten image and a teacher of lies that the maker of the work trusts us therein to make a dumb idol. <laughs> I like that uh, phrase. I can see God uh, sitting in heaven going, what are you guys doing? You know, what are you making those dumb little statues for? They're not going to do nothing for you. Okay, moving on. Verse 22, 
for he is great. The Lord will not forsake the people for his great name's sake, because he hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. And some other verses on this. In Exodus 32, 12, Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. It's also in Numbers 14, 13. So why did God make Israel his very own people? God did not choose them because they deserved it, as Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8 uh, tells us. Let me read it. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out from a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen, from the hand of the Pharaoh king of Egypt. It also mentioned it in Deut Deuteronomy 31.6 also. But in order that they might become his channel of blessing to all people through the Messiah. And of course, going back to Genesis 12, 1 through 3, the famous, uh, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Going all the way back to Abraham. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curses thee. And thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's that one verse right there is, a, is why it's so important that we don't forget, forsake God's land, Israel. Because God chose the people of Israel, he would never abandon them. But because they were his special nation, he would often punish them for the disobedience in order to bring them back into a right relationship with him. Okay. On to verse 23. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Is failing to pray for others a sin? Samuel's words seem to indicate that it is. His actions illustrate two of God's people's responsibilities. They should pray constantly for others. That's mentioned in uh, Ephesians 6.18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. But some other verses on this as we look in the New Testament also. In Romans 1, 9, But God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I may mention of you always in my prayers. Colossians 1, 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And for Thessalonians 3.10, Night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Okay. So you should pray for it and they should teach others the right way to God. That's in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faith, Faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Samuel disagreed with the Israelites' demand for a king, but he assured them that he would continue to pray for them and teach them. We may disagree with others, but we shouldn't stop praying for them. Okay, on to verse 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, but consider how great things he has done for you. Oh, great things. Oh, what a great thing. Uh, looking at Deuteronomy 10.21. He is the praise and he is thy God that hath done for thee these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. This is the second time in his farewell speech that Samuel reminded the people to take time to consider what great things God has done for them. Taking time for reflection allows us to focus our attention on God's goodness and strengthens our faith. Sometimes we are so pro progress and future oriented that we fail to take time to recall that God has already done. Remember what God has done for you so that you may move ahead with gratitude. 
So finishing up this chapter, but if, you, but if you shall still do wickedly, you shall be consumed, both ye and your king. And unfortunately, that's going to happen. Uh, looking again at Joshua 24, 20. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. And after that, he hath done you good. And of course, jumping ahead a little bit, you'll see when we get to chapter 31, uh, that that's true is what's going to happen. I'll just read the first five verses. Saul will be taken out. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gibeo. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan, Abinad, and Meshios, Saul's sons. And the battle was sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest thou these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. And when the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. Sad day. We'll get that in chapter 31. But unfortunately, uh, the Israelites didn't want to follow God's suggestion at that time frame. And even though he, the, the, even though the Lord may allow us to do things, it doesn't necessarily be in our best interest. Uh, if we think that God is allowing us, be careful because of it, uh, what it says in the Bible. Uh, so I think it's important we pray that we pray in such a way that uh, we don't assume God is uh, is okay with something, and that we should uh, allow for a signal from Him uh, either through His Word or some other method. I am very guilty of this uh, on many occasions, I'm sure, as it. Uh, I, I want to follow the Lord deeply, but uh, flesh, fleshly desires sometimes get in the way. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, thank you for this important message uh, to be able to always look to you for guidance and to help us to understand uh, what that guidance is so we can follow you uh, correctly and to the letter. I thank you and give you praise for all you do for each of us. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Okay, so Amos tomorrow, and uh, back into that book. I'm enjoying that book too. That's a interesting guy because uh, he's a he wasn't a prophet like Samuel. He wasn't born to be a prophet, uh, but he was called upon by God to deliver a message to the Northern Kingdom. So we'll get back into that tomorrow, and we'll be uh, and then on the next week we'll be back in Samuel uh, next Monday and Tuesday. So, hope to see you then, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Have a great day.